thanks a lot for inviting me and thanks a lot for putting together such a wonderful uh, conference. Um, uh, and feel free to ask questions throughout, especially clarifying questions. I think questions about the, you know, about what we're doing more, more broadly would be best answered at the end. Um, in the canonical Bayesian persuasion model, we make typically two assumptions, and I'm, I'm glad that Itai gave a talk earlier because this is kind of a, a good example of that. We assume that um, the sender knows the receiver's sources of information, and moreover, that she can coordinate receivers on her preferred equilibrium. These are the typical assumptions that the assumptions that are being made in the in the canonical case, but also in, in most of the papers studying persuasion. And as a result, and that I think everyone kind of experienced working on these topics, the optimal information structure is often quite sensitive to the fine details of this knowledge, the knowledge of the sender about the environment, informational environment, strategic environment in which the receivers are interacting. Uh, and in contrast, uh, in many problems of interest, especially if you take kind of a more pragmatic practical approach, these assumptions might simply be false. Um, so the sender might not exactly be sure what the sources of information of the different receivers are other than this sender signal itself. And she may not be confident that she's able to coordinate the receivers on her preferred equilibrium, right? And this motivates a quest for robustness that, that we try to attempt in, in this paper. So more concretely, we are going to propose a robust solution concept for Bayesian persuasion that first of all, incorporates a concern for robustness by thinking about the worst case scenario you're gonna see in a minute, but it will not abandon the Bayesian model completely, hence the, the name robust Bayesian persuasion. I think it will become clear why we chose this name. And the other thing I wanna mention at the very beginning is even though this paper is entirely about Bayesian persuasion, we think of this general approach as being portable to other problems, to context outside of uh, information design, maybe to mechanism design more, more generally. Uh, now, because it's a very short talk, it will be a somewhat differently structured from the other talks uh, today. I'm just gonna focus on an example throughout most of the talk. And then at the end, I'll try to tell you more about literature and, and, and our approach more generally. Okay, so if we're talking about example and, and Bayesian persuasion, what better than the judge example, right? Uh, so we're going to look at the judge example slightly modified. So our sender is a prosecutor, the receiver is a judge, there is also a suspect in the background. We're going to have three states, unless, uh, unlike Kamenitz and Gensko. So the suspect can be innocent, or she can be guilty of a misdemeanor or a felony. And the prior is just going to be half-half guilty, not guilty, conditional being guilty, there's a half-half probability of a misdemeanor or a felony. The judge will convict the suspect if she believes her to be guilty with probably at least two thirds. And on top of that, the judge is going to choose a sentence, numbers of years in prison or something like this from some interval. And the sentence is in fact going to be linearly increasing in the conditional probability of a felony up to some cap. So when the judge is already convinced that the conditional probability of felonies uh, at least a half, she will just choose the maximal sentence of X bar. So here's just to summarize the payoff of the prosecutor of our sender. Right, so again, the joint, when the joint probability of guilty exceeds two thirds, the suspect is, is convicted. And this is the sentence, it's linearly increasing in this conditional probability of a felony up to a cap of X bar. That's just the example that we want to study. Uh, first, for context, let us solve for the Bayesian persuasion solution, just you know, the usual uh, Kamenetz against co solution. And we kind of set it up to make it very similar to the, the classical case. So the prosecutor is going to induce two posterior beliefs by sending a binary signal. Uh, conditional on the state innocence, she's going to reveal the state truthfully with probability half, and otherwise she's going to garble that innocent state with the other two states and going to induce this uh, symmetric uh, posterior belief one third, one third, one third. And you can see this is exactly enough to uh, induce the judge to convict and exactly enough for the judge to choose the maximal sentence. So if ex ante probability three quarters, uh, the sender manages to convince the, the judge to choose the maximal sentence and has, hence her payoff is three quarters times the maximal sentence X bar. All right, but I wanna point out one thing about this, uh, this solution, which I already alluded to earlier. There's kind of an implicit assumption, right? That the prosecutor believes or, or, or conjectures, as we're gonna put it, uh, that she's the sole provider of information, that the judge is only listening to the prosecutor and is, is not accessing any other sources of information. And this might simply be wrong. For example, what if the judge calls a witness, right? In a kind of unexpected way. Um, now, because we want to think about this in a robust way, we're not going to assume that the prosecutor can attach probabilistic beliefs to what might happen, right? So she might not know the likelihood of the witness appearing. She might not know exactly how much information the witness has, or what are the witness's motives, okay? 
Uh, and as a result, and this is kind of typical approach uh, when there is this non-Bayesian uncertainty, the sender is going to be concerned about the worst case scenario. So let's first ask, what is the, what is the best thing to do in, in this worst case scenario? And here there is actually a very, a very simple answer, right? The sender cannot do better than just fully disclosing the state, okay? And I can actually prove it in two very simple steps. Well, she clearly cannot do strictly better, right, in the worst case, because if she tried to engineer some other policy, the witness, when she's adversarial, can always just disclose the state and bring the payoff back to this full disclosure payoff. This, by the way, I forgot to say that, but this is the full disclosure payoff, right? With probably one quarter, uh, it's the misdemeanor, I get the minimal sentence, one quarter is the, is the felony, I get the maximal sentence as the prosecutor. So I cannot do better than, strictly better than full disclosure. But this upper bound is achievable because I can just disclose the state myself as a sender, right? Hence, and this is, but this is, this is known, this is uh, already observed by Hu and Wang. So uh, in the worst case scenario, the best I can do is fully disclose the state. And here's the key point, the key idea of this paper. We are going to argue that the sender nevertheless should not fully disclose the state in this case, even if she is concerned about the worst case scenario. And we're going to try to argue uh, in favor of this claim by, by constructing what we believe as a superior, as a superior policy for the, for the prosecutor. So here's the, it's quite a simple policy. The prosecutor will reveal the state innocent, but she will say nothing about the relative likelihood of a misdemeanor versus a felony. Okay, that's, that's the policy. Now, what is the worst case scenario? When the state is innocent, uh, the prosecutor reveals the state, so the witness has no more information to reveal. Nothing, is, nothing more is going to happen. When the state is misdemeanor or felony, well, then the witness will best respond by revealing the state. And this is not immediate, but if you look at the, ob the objective function of the prosecutor, right, it turns out to be concave on that part of the, on the state space. So the worst that can happen uh, is that the witness reveals the state. And thus, in, in the worst case scenario, right, the payoff is exactly the same as under full disclosure, because at the end, when the witness speaks in the most adversarial way, we're going to end up with full disclosure of the state. So this policy is exactly as good as full disclosure in the worst case. However, if the conjecture of the sender, which just to remind you is that she's the sole provider of information, right, happens to be right, then this policy actually outperforms full disclosure. That's the, that's the key point, right? And to see that, notice that when the state is M or F, in this case, this policy says that the prosecutor stays silent, right? The judge's belief is going to be zero half half, which is just enough to induce the judge to choose the maximal sentence, always in a uh, condition on, 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 this, on this message, rather than you know, this, this lottery between uh, a minimal and maximal sentence. So to summarize, this policy is just as good as full disclosure in the worst case, but it's strictly better when the sender's conjecture actually turns out to be right. And moreover, you can prove that in, in this example, the uh, among policies that are worst case optimal, which is to say that they, they bring the full disclosure payoff in the worst case, this is the best that the, the sender can do against the conjecture. And this is exactly what we're going to call a robust solution, okay? So robust solution uh, will maximize the sender's payoff against the conjecture or under the conjecture, but over the set of policies that maximize the sender's payoff in the worst case scenario. And I'll come back to this uh, later to this definition more generally. But before I do, I wanna make one more point about this example, which is why not use a Bayesian solution, right? So if we kind of argued that, well, if the, if the witness is adversarial, she'll just disclose the state, the Bayesian solution will do even better under the conjecture because the Bayesian solution by definition is optimized just against the conjecture. So why not use a, a Bayesian solution? And the reason why a Bayesian solution is maybe not such a good idea is that it's not robust. It's not going to be worst case optimal. And here's why. In the Bayesian solution, as I argued, uh, the prosecutor will sometimes uh, say that send this message guilty, which induces the symmetric posterior belief one third, one third, one third, right? And here's an adversarial scenario that's possible. The witness might, be, might always be telling the truth or revealing what she knows, but suppose she only knows the state F with conditional probability epsilon, and she knows nothing otherwise, right? In that scenario, whenever the witness is silent, right, with probability one minus epsilon, the judge's belief is gonna become slightly more optimistic towards innocent, right? And because at the optimal Bayesian solution, the judge's belief was already at the threshold of convicting, even shifting a little bit towards innocence is gonna be enough to change the judge's uh, decision to acquitting the suspect, right? And as a result, um, the expected payoff from the Bayesian solution in the worst case is actually zero, 
So there's no positive payoff guarantee that you can get in this example from using a Bayesian solution. So it's, it's not the Bayesian solution in this example and generally uh, need not be robust to misspecifications uh, in the center's conjecture about the learning environment, right? Okay, so that's the example. So now more generally, what, what is our approach? Uh, the center has a conjecture, right? Which is just the Bayesian belief that, that the center has in a standard um, canonical Bayesian persuasion model. But unlike in the standard case, she's concerned about the robustness. Yes, there's a question. Um, so I understand that in the worst, the argument about the worst case, but is it true uh, something even stronger, namely for any witness, it is the case that your robust uh, design is better than the Bayesian design? Or there are uh, possible no, witnesses so which, where, where things are reversed? Great question. No, so under the conjecture, if you just ignore the worst case scenario, in fact, the Bayesian solution is better because we, we've shown earlier- No witness, right, for no witness. Right, for the wit no witness case is actually strictly better, right? So, and in general, uh, it's very rare to have cases where you can, what you're asking for is, is basically a solution that's dominant. That's very rare. However, I won't have time to, to talk about this. We'll prove a, a much weaker claim that our robust solutions are undominated, but it's going in the same direction. So. Of course, in general, they won't be dominant. In, in general, they won't be a dominant solution, but a robust solution will never be dominated. Whereas a Bayesian solution can be dominated sometimes. Not in this example, but it can be sometimes. Not, but okay, but I'm going kind of ahead of myself, but just to give a flavor of, of, of the relationship between dominance and the solution concept. Thank you. Okay, so, so the, unlike in the standard case, the center is concerned about the robustness of her chosen policy. And so robust solutions are going to be defined in two steps. First, there's the step that we call preparing for the worst. So it's kind of a, a first step where the, the center pre-selects policies that are optimal in the worst case scenario. So they maximize the center's payoff under the assumption that nature, more generally now, provides information and coordinates play to minimize the center's payoff, right? So this is the first pre-selection stage. Then there is the second step, if there are multiple policies surviving the first step, which we call hoping for the best. And here, among all these worst case optimal policies, the nature selects the one that is optimal under the conjecture, okay? And so in, in one sentence, robust solutions are defined as policies that are best case optimal among worst case optimal ones. Uh, now I wanna make one comment here, which is that uh, it's quite possible that what we call best case scenario is a misnomer. I wanna be very clear about this. What we mean by the best case scenario is that the conjecture is right. We don't mean that nature is actively trying to maximize um, the center's payoff, which would be a kind of an alternative definition. And we're actually debating right now if Alessandro if even using this phrase is useful. It's, it, it's not quite precise, but it does allow us to kind of summarize the definition in this one intuitive sentence. Okay, so, so what, yeah. I ask, okay. So you gave it, in your example, the conjecture seems extremely natural, um, but in general, um, you want the conjecture to be a fully specified right. description of the environment. Yes. Um, yes. I guess where I'm going is, is I like the result about undominated because it, it helps to better understand the role of the conjecture. Um, it, you're nodding, so it seems like you seem to understand what I'm saying about, th there seems a bit of a tension between the, the way you think about the worst case scenario and the very, very specific way you think about the conjecture. Right. So, so basically, I think the what I said earlier is that we don't want to depart completely from the Bayesian model. I think that's where the conjecture is coming into play. There is some sort of weight on this sort of baseline case that the, the center has in mind. It's just that she's sort of not sure that this is really going to happen, right? So this is one way to think about the conjecture. You're absolutely right. Because of this result that I mentioned, I won't actually get to it formally. But a different way to think about it is that you can select any conjecture you want, compute those robust solutions, and what you're going to get is something that's undominated. Under some, I forgot to mention, there are some regularity conditions for that result, but there's sort of a, a different way to think about it. Thank you. All right, so what's the general model? I won't actually give you the, the model because I think uh, it's quite easy to formalize these ideas. In, in general, we're studying a, an arbitrary persuasion problem with one restriction, which is important for our results, that the center uses public signals. So we can handle multiple receivers, but we have to assume that the center is restricted to using public signals. And we don't know how to extend the results that we have to private signals. In general, we're gonna talk about nature uh, and nature is going to choose an arbitrary signal. 
and we'll select an equilibrium in, in some class, right? And this is again important for our results that nature, just like the witness in the example, can condition the signal on the sender signal realization. And this captures the idea that perhaps the sender is concerned that once she reveals her information, conditional on that disclosure, the receivers are going to acquire more information. Okay, that, that's actually crucial for our results. Um, then coming back to Max's question, actually, we are going to allow for arbitrary conjectures, right? So in the example, it was just the simplest possible conjecture that I'm the only provider of information. But more generally in the model, you can have an arbitrary conjecture about the environment. You can conjecture that there is a witness with some probability and she has some information. It's just that you know the, the concern for robustness is that I'm going to consider the worst case if this conjecture turns out to be uh, wrong. And then, as I mentioned, a robust solution will just maximize the center payoff against the conjecture among all of, all policies that are uh, optimal in the worst case scenario. Where again, the worst case scenario is understood as nature choosing the information structure and equilibrium to minimize the center's payoff. And now I'm going to, to I'm going to attempt to give you the the main technical result of the paper without introducing the model and notation. And the only reason I can do that, I think, I hope, uh, is that there is a very close analogy to the Bayesian persuasion solution. So I think it will be clear. But but stop me or, or slow me down if it's not clear. So we know from Kamenetz and Gensko that a distribution row of of posterior beliefs is a Bayesian solution if it maximizes the expected payoff of the sender over all base plausible distributions, right, of posterior beliefs. This V hat is just the payoff of the sender from inducing a posterior belief mu. The hat indicates that it's under the conjecture, right? So this is, this is how a Bayesian solution is defined. And now it turns out that we can characterize robust solutions in a very analogous way, except that there will be an additional constraint. So the formal theorem, which we call the separation theorem, is that there exists some collection of, of subsets of the state space, such that rho is a robust solution if it maximizes the same objective function, again, over all base plausible distributions, but under the additional constraint that the supports of posterior beliefs induced by rho lie or belong to the set F. So somewhat informally, this collection F describes the, the, the collection of, P of allowed supports of posterior beliefs. You cannot induce posterior beliefs uh, that have a support that does not belong to F. Right? That's the only constraint. And moreover, this is kind of the, the key to tractability. We can actually give a, almost a closed form expression for the set F. Right? Uh, so basically, a, a subset of the state space B belongs to the set F. So it's an, an allowed support for posterior beliefs if, for all beliefs supported on that set B, the payoff to the sender from inducing any such posterior belief is higher than the full disclosure payoff. And this lower bar means that we evaluate that payoff under the worst equilibrium selection or worst tie breaking. Okay. Uh, by the way, I strongly suspect that there is a way to phrase this condition using the affine dominance um, language from the first talk. It's, it's quite related. I think basically this is saying that the direct deltas on, in that set B are affine, are affine dominating uh, the, the function V hat, but I would have to think about it, but it's, it's related, right? And, and I know I, I'm going fast through this, but what I want to emphasize is it's easy to compute that set F because these are pretty much primitives of the model. You don't have to solve the nature's problem or the sender's problem. All you have to solve is the best response of the receiver or the worst equilibrium uh, if there are multiple receivers, and you can very easily check that condition. Computing the full disclosure payoff is, is going to be very simple. So you can just check what the set F is, and then you can solve for robust solutions by just imposing this additional constraint that supports of posterior beliefs must belong to the set F. Okay. So this is the main technical result. And now I'm gonna tell you briefly what are the consequences of, of this technical result. So first of all, a robust solution, oh, there's a question maybe? Uh, can I interrupt? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, on the previous slide, um, is this set uh, F closed under downward inclusion? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So in it's the important. sense that a, and it's important, a, yes. Okay, yeah, because yeah. Uh, it's sort of related to when, you, to when you write the support is in this set, you're exactly referring to the fact that uh, the, uh, the set of states at which there is strictly positive probability. Yes, yes, but, but you're absolutely right. This is actually very important for the next point I'm going to make, okay. which is that a robust solution actually exists under standard assumptions. By standard, I mean we need to assume upper semi-continuity of the, the V-hat and lower semi-continuity of the lower selection from the equilibrium. 
But I emphasize this, this actually, this is actually surprising, it was surprising to us. And again, I can use the first talk to kind of back this claim because uh, each I had to assume continuity of his payoff functions precisely for the same reason that we always sort of get when there is adversarial um, tie-breaking selection or something like this, right? We typically run into problems of existence. We don't run into such problems here. I don't have time to explain why, but if you're curious why using this very special structure of the Bayesian persuasion problem, right? So this is only, I, I think, in this, in, this, in this problem that we get this, we can prove existence under standard assumptions. I'm happy to elaborate later if you're, if you're curious. But now going to kind of economic properties of robust solutions, we prove that for any Bayesian solution, right? There exists a robust solution that is either not comparable in the Blackwell order or is strictly more informative. So to put it more informally, a, a robust solution is never less informative than a Bayesian solution. So even, even more informally, robustness calls for more information disclosure. So this is kind of the main economic prediction of robustness is that the sender wants to disclose more information herself to kind of protect herself against this adversarial nature. Um, the next point I want to make, uh, this is actually coming back to an uh, earlier question by Xiao Sheng about whether this is more or less, or is it strictly more, or, sorry, strictly less tractable than Bayesian persuasion. Here I can tell you it's exactly as tractable as Bayesian persuasion, if not more, because we can prove the result that I think you wanted back then, that robust solutions can be found by just concavifying a modified objective function. And that actually is very easy to see from the characterization result, because this, this, the, the only additional constraint that we need applies posterior by posterior, right? So we can just use the usual trick of saying, you know, for every posterior belief that has a support that's not allowed, let's just modify this B function to be very low, right? So that I would never want to induce such beliefs. And this way I can, I can incorporate the constraint into the objective function. And then I'm, I'm, I'm just left with a completely standard Bayesian persuasion problem. So any techniques that we have available for Bayesian persuasion can also be applied here. Omer, do you have a question? Yeah. Four minutes oh, now, sir. Four minutes, okay, good. Um, Jordan, one more problem. Is, yeah. is it obvious that you could do this trick? I mean, you didn't tell us anything about if, so it's not obvious you can do this trick and then ma maintain the continuity uh, requirements that you need. Yes. Okay. So we have to do it somewhat carefully. You're right. And we do it carefully in the paper. We cannot just naively lower the function to any number. We have to do it somewhat carefully, but it, it can be done. And the detail is yeah. showing the paper. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we proved the so if you we have this very sort of strong assumption that there's the lexicographic approach, right? We first look at the worst case, then at the conjecture. Mac was kind of alluding to this. Maybe this is a little bit odd. So we look at something slightly less odd, I think, which is that um, the center is going to maximize a weighted sum. So she put some weight on the worst case scenario and some weight on the conjecture, and we prove uh, that the limits uh, or the limit of, of of these solutions actually converge to our robust solutions under some regularity conditions, as the weight on the worst case scenario converges to one. So if the problem is regular, there is no sort of discontinuity. It, it's not, there is no sort of, um, the lexicographic approach doesn't make things sort of knife edge, right? That there is still continuity if I just put a little bit of weight on, on the conjecture and, mo and most weight on the adversarial selection. And finally, um, this is something I mentioned already in response to the questions, when the conjecture satisfies a certain I think per relatively permissive uh, condition, all robust solutions are undominated, right? So we can guarantee that there is no other solution that for all the possible responses of nature are, are weakly and sometimes strictly better, which is, again, so one way to think about robust solutions, if you're just interested in generating something that's undominated, you can just choose any conjecture satisfying that condition and automatically all the robust solutions are going to be undominated. Okay, this is not true about Bayesian solutions, by the way. Okay, so I'm almost out of time, I guess. Let me just quickly talk about some relationships to other papers. Uh, there is some work, especially recently on information design with adversarial coordination or adversarial equilibrium selection. Um, we focus more on, um, on the adversarial choice of information sources. Uh, and there are also some papers on this, especially Hu and Wang and Costarina. They look at, at cases when uh, indeed the sender is not certain uh, what the information sources are. Um, Hu and Wang observed that, um, you know, full disclosure is, is always optimal in the worst case. And then they look at sort of local uncertainty to get around this trivial result that full disclosure is always optimal. And then Costa Rina is looking at a specific model where, um, where nature can only send signals that are conditionally independent 
of the sender signal. And we assume that the nature can condition on the signalization of the sender that is actually crucial for many of our results. And finally, there's some connection to work that was already mentioned on, on sequential uh, information design. Actually, one more point I wanna make is about Berger's paper. If you know this paper by Tillman, it's actually very close in spirit. What he does in the context of mechanism design is kind of criticizing worst case optimality by making a very similar point that sometimes you can construct a mechanism that is just as good in the worst case, but actually dominates that original mechanism if you look at all, all other possible cases, right? We just turn this idea, I think, into something more operational and we prove that it's actually very tractable in the context of Bayesian persuasion. I'm probably out of time, so let me just conclude. Uh, we looked at a Bayesian persuasion model where the sender doesn't trust her conjecture about the exogenous sources from which inform receivers might be learning and about her ability to coordinate play on her preferred equilibrium. And we developed this idea of robust solutions that maximize the payoff of the center under the conjecture, but only on the set of policies that survive um, this first step of eliminating policies that are not worst case optimal. Uh, we showed that in, in some pretty strong sense, these solutions are actually surprisingly weakly more tractable than Bayesian solutions. Sometimes they are more tractable in the sense that we couldn't solve the corresponding Bayesian problem, but we can uh, solve the robust solution because this constraint is already uh, putting a lot of, uh, sort of reducing the degrees of freedom to a sufficient degree that we can actually solve for robust solutions. They never disclose less information than Bayesian solutions and they are under some conditions guaranteed to be undominated. Uh, future work I, I think will be very nice to try to apply a similar approach in mechanism design. Um, I think the obstacle is going to be tractability. Uh, it's just that in this particular problem, characterizing worst case optimal distributions turns out to be very tractable. I don't think this will be always the case. And as was, I think, already mentioned uh, during the talk, right? The, this idea of lexicographic um, approach and then looking at the worst case and then the conjecture, uh, I, I fully admit this is kind of pragmatic and ad hoc. It would be very nice to work on some more, you know, firm foundations from a decision theoretic perspective. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much. Um, let me uh, ask a question from the chat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this has already been clarified or not. So, but the question is: Is there solution in the example robust to small changes in the judge's preferences? In the judge's preferences, I, I don't think I, I see no reason why that would be true in general. If it's true in the example, it's only by chance, I think. I mean, I, the question is: Are changes in the in the preference of the judge somehow uh, related to changes in the information that the judge is getting. I don't think this is true in general. I can easily imagine that there are changes to the utility function of the judge that cannot be replicated by some policy of information policy by the by nature. And then I wouldn't expect the results to hold. Um, but we we do have we do have some results in the paper in the general model that could speak to that, because basically the way we think about in the general model, the way we think about equilibrium selection is that there's just going to be a set of possible payoff functions. And I think when you, when you generate that set of possible payoff functions, you can generate it by just varying the utility function of the receiver. Um, and so I think there, there could be a way to incorporate uh, this concern for robustness or, or mistakes about my uh, beliefs about the, the, the receiver's of, uh, utility function. Um, so, so I think it will be possible. I don't want to speculate too much, especially that I haven't shown you the full-fledged model, but I think uh, reading the paper might be a little bit helpful. The later sections that generalize might be helpful in answering that question. Um, there is another, sorry, uh, Rand, go ahead. I was no, going no, to read the next. I already asked the question. Uh, no, there was another question from uh, the chat, but perhaps Hai, uh, Hai Feng wanted to ask it himself. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, I can, I can definitely ask it directly. So, mm -hmm. so it looks like your solution concept has two steps, but when you are preparing for the worst, you're trying to kind of get all the optimal solution that maximize the worst case. So mm -hmm. it might happen that you actually only get one optimal solution, so you don't really get Absolutely. a chance to hope for the best in the next step. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So actually, this is not a rare case, to be honest. So in many problems, you get from the first step that the only thing you can do is full disclosure. And then you don't need to think about the second step because full disclosure is the only thing you can do, right? And, and I, I'm fine with that. I mean, I'm fine with saying that sometimes the robust solution is just, you know, is full disclosure. 
In fact, I, I can now explain why I looked at the judge example with two states, uh, with three states instead of two, because with two states, the separation theorem implies that there are only two things that can happen. Either you have to separate the two states and then full disclosure is optimal, or you don't have to separate anything, but then you're back to just based on persuasion. So in the binary case, right, um, you either have that full disclosure is uniquely optimal or that the Bayesian solution is, is robust, right? And more, and more generally, there are cases with more states when the first step is already constraining you so much that you just have to fully disclose the state. And again, I'm, I'm okay with this in the sense that uh, I think if, if that's the prediction of the theory, that's fine. We, we can think what's wrong about the assumptions, but as a conclusion, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conclusion that I'm fine with. Uh, correspondingly, just sorry, just commenting on this briefly, there are other problems where it's uh, kind of the opposite, uh, where that first step is will have no bite. For example, uh, you know the the famous paper by by Bergman, Brooks, and Morris, the limits of price discrimination. When you consider the optimal policy for the buyer in that paper, that first is the the first step will have no bite. So what it shows is that in their problem, the Bayesian solution is actually robust, which I think is interesting because their optimal solution is extremely complicated. It, it's very it's sort of a very fine detailed information structure and yet it is robust and i like this because it shows that you know robustness is not about uh, how complicated that 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 scheme is it's, it's really about how it behaves in those adversarial adversarial scenarios right so this is kind of a convoluted answer but i hope it, it somewhat answers your question uh yeah yeah that makes sense thank you yeah Piotr, given the difficulty of uh of uh uh, the foundations of the decision problem or the decision. Uh, uh, the thank you very much. Oh, um, no, sorry. Oh, is there time for I'm, another question? Or I'm not sure what happened. You? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I think seems, it's, it yeah. seems like the storm began and Omer froze. <laughs> So, Piotr, I'll, I'll take advantage of the fact that Homer's Yeah, person. just go ahead. Go ahead and ask. Yeah. Why? Uh, uh, you, one other way to uh, maybe to present the paper is to say, let me talk about undominated uh, um, um, information design. And mm -hmm. voila, it has this interesting feature that it sort of, that it, you can obtain it vis-a-vis -vis the scheme of uh, worst case, prepare for the worst case and hope for the best case. Why is uh, that? Uh, yeah. Why didn't you take that approach in presenting the, the paper? Well, I, I think first of all, we do we know that or we don't. So I, I don't know if it's true that the set of undominated policies is equal to the set of robust solutions as you consider all possible conjectures. I don't know if it's true. That's one answer. The second answer is that if that in general, if you just require being undominated, it's not a very strong requirement. So in a typical problem, there are lots and lots of policies that are undominated. So it's a nice property to, to have, but I, I don't think that this in itself has a lot of bite in kind of restricting the set of, of policies that are interesting. I think what we propose is, again, somewhat pragmatic. Uh, it's not super well-founded, but it, it does have bite in, in many problems. Uh, and it does narrow the set of, of solutions to a typically a, a small set versus, again, being undominated is, it, I don't want to say generically because I don't have a formal theorem, but I think it, typically it's, it's not, very risk in, in particular Bayesian solutions are typically undominated still because they by definition they are optimal in this best case scenario under the conjecture right so typically they will not be dominated 